Hugo, díselo a las chicas, díselo a las chicas de ahí. Yeah, the, the, the girls, the girls, are coming because it's, it's kind of tricky. I tried to do that myself yesterday and I couldn't. You have to press something. Good morning, everyone. It's really quite early time for uh, working, but I believe that uh, the presentations and discussions will hold your attention uh, in the following hour and 30, 35 uh, minutes because we are a little bit uh, late. Uh, Professor Dennis Weber, who is coming from the University of Amsterdam, Netherlands, and I, Professor Gordon Ailich Popov, who is coming from the University of Belgrade, Faculty of Law from the host country, Serbia. As the co-chairs, wish you welcome to the fourth session of this great international conference. Uh, and uh, uh, the main topic of the session four uh, is international individual taxation issues under tax treaties and beyond. Uh, we have three speakers and uh, two panelists. Uh, uh, one is, uh, we have some uh, other uh, official duties and he will not be able to join us. Uh, and of course, uh, we will not be able, uh, because of the limited time that we have at disposal to tackle uh, all questions and issues which could be otherwise relevant for the main topic, but uh, our presenters uh, and our discutants, and of course, uh, uh, some maybe from the audience, uh, will address uh, the some of them. Uh, we are all uh, witnesses that in the recent times uh, the, the mobility of individuals uh, has rapidly increased, especially for economic reasons, but in my personal opinion, not only for, uh, for those uh, reasons. Of course, that the mo movement of uh, people uh, has uh, certain tax implications because uh, countries uh, either attempt to uh, prevent or to avoid uh, a brain drain, but uh, on the other side, uh, the other countries uh, try to uh, attract a brain gain, which is followed by gain in income and investments. Uh, uh, so uh, every country uh, is uh, able to 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 uh, to, to choose uh, the measures uh, which will be uh, uh, used for uh, achieving these goals. Uh, many measures, of course, among them uh, are the tax measures. And some countries uh, uh, opt for uh, tax measures which. Uh, we can say that they are of uh, some kind, some kind of uh, defensive tax nature, uh, which means that they are aimed at uh, preventing uh, individuals to uh, move abroad. But if they do so, uh, they uh, will be obliged to pay tax. Yesterday, we had an opportunity. Uh, to hear much more about the so-called Bhagwati tax and exit tax from Professor Browner. And uh, today, one of our speaker, Professor Moreno, will also give uh, uh, some uh, of his observations to the, uh, to the traditional emigration taxes and also uh, give some points uh, uh, about uh, according to, to his uh, point of view, limitations of uh, these uh, taxes, of course, uh, very briefly. Uh, on the other uh, side, uh, majority of countries uh, um, uses tax measures uh, uh, aimed at uh, retaining individuals uh, to, uh, uh, to, to, to stay within their jurisdictions and uh, to discourage them from moving abroad. Uh, these tax measures are related 
of course, not uh, to all individuals, but to certain types of individuals, uh, like high income individuals or highly skilled individuals. Yes, they, we also uh, hear, uh, heard about that uh, much more. Or maybe uh, uh, they are related to the senior executives. Uh, these, tax uh, these tax measures are uh, uh, certainly and factually tax incentives of special tax uh, regimes. And uh, um, one uh, or first uh, of our uh, speakers, uh, Dr. Mario Tenore, who is coming from uh, Pinola, uh, 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 Pirola Pinotto Zei from Italy, uh, will give uh, us an, a brief overview of the special tax regimes, uh, especially those uh, benefiting, uh, benefiting uh, uh, foreign source uh, income, either by flat rate or exempt, uh, uh, some uh, income exemptions. Uh, and then uh, regimes uh, uh, benefiting uh, both the foreign and domestic income, uh, and of course uh, some uh, special tax regimes uh, um, boosting the mobility of certain types of income. Of course, uh, uh, let me say that uh, in the context uh, we are today speak in this session, uh, the special tax regimes do not encompass uh, uh, any tax heaven or the low tax jurisdictions, of course, because they are not relevant from the tax treaty perspective. As we uh, all know, uh, these states do not have double tax treaty and they generally do not offer any tax treaty protection. So uh, I uh, have a pleasure to give a floor to uh, Dr. Tenore. Floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Uh, first of all, I think a uh, few words to uh, express my profound gratitude to this gentleman here who made uh, this um, possible. Uh, there is a hard work behind and so I think we um, we must be very grateful to you uh, Sveti thanks a lot we feel like being at home these days in in uh, in Belgrade having said that so I um, I was uh, given the uh, the task to uh, analyze the uh, special tax regimes which apply on an international basis it may seem like a, a boring exercise, but I, I can tell you it was not. Also from a scientific point of view, I think it was far from being a boring exercise because looking at the various tax regimes, you really understand uh, the policy behind. And uh, some of them are also what I call the result of a tax engineering uh, uh, let's say construction, but let's have a look at those regime. Which what I I tried um, to do was to cluster in in groups, and uh, I clustered them into three different groups depending on the ultimate effects of the uh, uh, regime itself. Of course, I mean several other uh, classifications may be uh, possible. So this is the one that I thought was the most pertinent, considering also the subjective scope of my analysis, which is referred to high net worth individuals as well as senior executives. So the first cluster includes uh, regimes that provide tax benefits on foreign source income. So on income derived from foreign sources. And uh, within this cluster, we may find various regimes. Uh, the first type of this subgroup is represented by regimes which do provide uh, an exemption on income sourced abroad. So 
full exemption. And they mentioned the Israeli tax regime as well as the uh, Swiss lump sum tax regime. Interestingly, however, uh, we should maybe start also thinking uh, differently when we look at these regimes, because we, we tend to uh, give them an harmful meaning. We have um, uh, also yesterday addressed to uh, such regimes with, uh, with the but, so to say, uh, um, way of thinking about them. But it's not always the case. For example, the Israeli uh, tax regime is an interesting one because certain taxpayers who relocate to Israel after being 10 years uh, tax resident abroad may indeed benefit of a full tax exemption. But, uh, and this will be also the topic for, for this session, they are not considered treaty entitled, they're not uh, eligible to uh, receive a tax resident certificate from the Israeli tax authorities unless they prove to live in the country for at least 142 days and unless they do not prove to uh, live in Israel the majority of, of the time within a calendar year and not to have lived in a, in a territory of another country for a longer period of time. So I think this is also a countermeasure uh, that the regime itself uh, includes in order to avoid uh, a sort of artificial use of such regime. Uh, going forward, we have the well-known UK uh, remittance-based uh, tax regime, which is uh, like the Maltese one, based upon the uh, remittance concept. So the exemption on the foreign source income is preserved unless the income is not remitted to the resident jurisdiction. And then we have the uh, uh, Greek and Italian uh, uh, tax regimes. They are a cut and paste, one of the other. So taxpayers uh, with certain conditions living, uh, uh, in, in the case of Italy, those who have lived uh, uh, for at least nine years abroad out of the last 10 years may pay a flat tax equal to 100,000 euros on all foreign source income. So there is not uh, a full exemption, but a payment of a flat tax uh, in the amount of 100,000 euros. Then we, we move forward and we look at the second cluster. There are regimes which are a combination uh, in the sense that they do entail benefits on foreign source income as well as on domestic source income. And the Portuguese and the Spanish regimes, I think, uh, are good examples. Um, the Portuguese regime, for example, uh, allows uh, the taxpayer to benefit from a reduced tax rate on domestic source income. The Spanish tax regime. The Spanish tax regime is, I think, the most interesting, not because I have two Spanish gentlemen on the session, but it's a tax engineering result. So if you move to Spain under certain conditions, you will be considered tax resident, but you will be taxed according to the rules for non-resident taxpayers. So meaning that you will only be taxed on uh, Spanish source income with a favorable tax rate. Foreign source income is not taxable. Uh, but this is a derogation. But there's a derogation of the derogation. If you have foreign uh, employment income, you can claim a tax credit, even if you are a non-resident. So, I mean, ultimately, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's a quite uh, interesting uh, regime, but... Uh, 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 quite complex to, to really properly understand and justify the, uh, the logic behind. When we move forward, we have uh, tax uh, benefits granted to inward expats. So these are regimes which are very common nowadays in Europe. Uh, I've, countried, I've counted I mean, more than five, six, seven jurisdictions. Italy is one of them. Uh, France is also one of them. 
Uh, we have also the Nordic countries having similar regimes. Essentially, these are regimes which provide tax benefit on domestic employment income. So that's the core of the regime in the form of a tax exemption or in the form of a, a reduced tax rate. These are regimes that do not raise uh, you know, particular issues from, from a tax treaty standpoint. It's just uh, based on the logic that you know, the state of residence uh, may tax uh, the, the employment income derived from the territory of that state with a specific uh, or special or reduced tax rate. But there are also some specific regimes within this category that uh, entail a tax benefit for, um, for example, private equity fund managers. These are the so-called carried interest regimes, which are uh, uh, well known in Italy, in France, Germany, also in the Basque country and in, in the Navarra region. Interestingly, in those uh, uh, cases, the uh, regime was introduced in connection with the Brexit. So to attract uh, managers to relocate from, from the UK back to, to Spain. And the uh, uh, point that it is, it is important to highlight is that some of these regimes are based on the logic that the income of the manager loses the characterization of employment income and is considered income of a financial nature. So dividends or capital gains, and therefore it's subject to a, a, a reduced tax because generally speaking, uh, these uh, items of income, capital gains, dividends are taxed uh, 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 more favorably than employment income, which is notably taxed with progressive tax rate. So we have as well within this uh, group, I think a sub uh, category of tax regimes, which now uh, uh, leads me to highlight what is the problem and what are the issues that we will discuss with, with my colleagues uh, afterwards. Because based on this characterization, we have uh, uh, asked ourselves, what are the tax treaty implications of these regimes? And uh, I have identified three possible, uh, so to say, uh, inter forms of interaction between the domestic uh, uh, law and the tax treaty law. Namely, first and foremost, the notion of residence and treated entitlement. Hugo Lopez will uh, go uh, deeper into this. Secondly, a possible conflict with respect to the sourcing of the income that may lead in some cases to uh, instances of double taxation. Third, conflicts of qualification. When the income takes a, a specific domestic characterization like in is the case of the uh, carried interest regime. You may have issues of conflicts of qualification when uh, the issue has, is brought at the tax treaty level. So, with respect to notion of, of residence and treaty entitlement, I won't, I won't say uh, too much because Hugo will also speak about this. My uh, main point is that the answer has to find on a regime by regime basis. So you, can, you can't approach this issue in a general fashion. You have to look at the uh, specific features of, of each single tax uh, regime. And also you have to take into account the uh, possible existence of a specific treaty wording. Uh, some regimes, as I said, uh, do allow treaty benefits, like in the case of the Israeli uh, tax regime, you may be considered treaty entitled. Others, like the Spanish one, it's written in the law. The taxpayer who wants to be taxed as a non-resident is not treaty entitled. 
in other cases, I found that uh, uh, tax authorities are uh, willing to take a position in favor of uh, treaty entitlement. This is the case of Italy, for example. According to the Italian taxpayers, those who relocate to Italy under the flat tax regime are to be considered treaty entitled because they are liable to tax under Article 4 as a consequence of the fact that foreign source income is not exempt but is subject to the flat tax. However, the flat tax is a substitute tax. It not only replaces personal income tax, but it does also replace wealth tax on specific items of income. So the point is, can we consider a flat tax, a tax covered by the treaty under Article 2? Because at the end, the liability to tax should be tested against a tax applicable in the resident jurisdiction, which is covered by the tax treaty. As I put on the slides, and Hugo will uh, develop further, to me, there is no clear-cut answer, because uh, there is a lot of uncertainty. The OECD commentary on the interpretation of the concept of liability to tax, comprehensive taxation, is very, very ambiguous. And as a proof of that, even if we look at the uh, case law around the world, we find inconsistent positions by the Supreme Court. I've pointed out two examples. One is the uh, case decided by the Italian Supreme Court, the Tiziano Ferro case. Tiziano Ferro is an Italian singer, very famous in Italy, quite famous outside of Italy. The Italian Supreme Court had to decide whether uh, Tiziano Ferro was treaty entitled under the treaty between Italy and the UK, uh, taking into account that the taxpayer was under the remittance basis uh, tax regime. And the uh, Italian Supreme Court took the position that he was not liable to tax because the capital gains derived uh, in Italy were not ultimately taxed in the UK. The uh, French Supreme Court in the Ragazzacci case in 2012 took a completely different approach. In a very similar case, still regarding the application of the UK res non dom regime, the court took the view that the taxpayer was, yes, liable to tax. The point was that he was not subject to tax, so he could not claim the specific tax regime, tax treatment, tax benefit included in Article 10, the refund of the tax credit, because the refund was ultimately subject to the dividends to be subject to tax in the UK. But he was liable to tax, so he could claim in principle the treaty benefits. But I'm sure that Hugo will develop this further. Two additional possible uh, interactions between uh, the uh, special tax regimes that we have analyzed and the uh, uh, application of treaty law. Well, as I said, conflict in sourcing. Some regimes, like the Spanish one, are based on the assumption that you get a tax benefit if the income is derived from Spanish sources. The point is, with respect to employment income, the regime entails a specific uh, deeming source rule, according to which the entire income of the taxpayer, wherever derived, is considered presumptively income from Spanish sources. So you may have a conflict, and I uh, uh, made in the uh, chapter, 
I wrote a couple of examples where under Article 15 of the treaty, also the other contracting states may uh, tax the income of the uh, employee. So the question is whether the fact that also Spain taxes the same income under the special tax regime triggers double taxation. And yes, the answer is positive. There is double taxation. Spain gives you a tax credit, however, as I said, although the taxpayer is taxed as a known resident, in this case, exceptionally, he gets a tax credit, but limited, kept to a, a given amount. So, uh, end of the day, the income may still be taxed in, in, in two different jurisdictions. Uh, well, I could make more uh, examples. The Italian tax regime is based on the opposite rationale, that you have to uh, assess the amount of the income which is domestic source and the amount of the income which is foreign source. Only income from foreign sources falls into the scope of application of the flat tax. And the question is, uh, where is the income sourced? So the Italian tax position, and Paolo, I'm sure that uh, you, you have uh, 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 a great experience uh, in this area. Italian tax position take a very, very specific view on what we call the day counting, because at the end for employment income, day counting is, 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 is a crucial element in order to assess whether income qualifies as foreign source or domestic source. And if there is a, a mismatch in this respect, still you have a conflict of uh, dual sources with respect to the same income. Last but not least, hopefully I'm not, uh, yeah, conflicts of qualification. Uh, as I said, some regimes do uh, apply the logic that income under certain condition loses the uh, nature of employment income and is considered uh, um, income of a financial nature, a dividends or a capital gain. I also made a couple of, of examples in, 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 my, in my chapter where I uh, tried to demonstrate that problems may arise on an international level because the income may be qualified uh, uh, differently from the jurisdiction of uh, the state of source and the state of residence. The point is uh, here, the term salary, wages, and other remuneration that we find in Article 15 is not defined in the treaty, nor we do find guidance in the OECD commentary. The question is, if the domestic uh, if the state of source applies its own qualification to the income due to a sp the application of a specific tax regime, does Article 3.2 of the treaty allows the, uh, 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 to, to give relevance to the domestic law meaning of, of the uh, uh, of the, to the domestic law characterization. And this is, in my view, a typical example of a conflict of qualification that arises from uh, a different meaning stemming from differences in domestic law. And therefore, I believe that following the guidance of the OECD commentary, which is a commentary, of course, the state of residence should follow the treaty qualification in the state of source and give double taxation relief accordingly. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mario, for your presentation. And as uh, uh, Mario already mentioned, uh, the uh, other interesting topic uh, within our session uh, relates to the interaction uh, of the special tax regimes to uh, the, especially uh, the allocation rules contained in the double tax treaties. For example, uh, according to some double or double tax treaties, certain types of income, like uh, for example, 
pension income uh, is subject to tax uh, only and exclusively in the state of residence. But this state exempts uh, uh, from taxation that income, while uh, at the same time, uh, the other contracting state, that is the source state, uh, is not entitled to uh, tax such income. Uh, so uh, we uh, th this interaction uh, could lead to uh, the double non-taxation or let's say to no taxation situation which uh, uh, could uh, uh, have uh, effects uh, to the budgets of the both contract uh, contracting states. In addition, uh, uh, it's also interesting to, to mention that uh, the interaction between uh, uh, the special tax regimes and the uh, double tax treated uh, uh, can be also reviewed from the aspect of the liability to tax. For example, uh, many double tax treaties uh, exclude from the scope of the application of that treaty those individuals uh, that uh, enjoy some uh, special uh, tax uh, regimes. Uh, so, uh, I, I think that uh, this uh, topic uh, could uh, provoke uh, uh, after the presentations could provoke some comments and some discussions. And now I give the floor to Professor Hugo Lopez, who is coming from the Public University of Navarra, Spain, who will further elaborate this topic. The floor is yours. Well, uh, good morning, uh, everyone. Um, first of all, thank you very much for uh, the kind invitation to, to participate in this uh, great uh, Congress. And congratulations to, to the Ford organizers for the, this great job, and especially uh, Spetislav for hosting us during this, uh, these days. Well, as uh, it has been already mentioned, uh, I'm going to, to talk about uh, special tax uh, regimes uh, uh, for, for individuals and, uh, uh, and more specifically on the interaction uh, with, uh, treaty, with treaty law. Uh, and basically uh, what I'm going to, to do during the, the next uh, few, few minutes uh, is uh, address uh, one uh, basic question, but not simple at all which is whether individuals benefiting from uh, special tax regimes uh, are entitled to, to treaties. And uh, the, the question that uh, arises uh, has been already mentioned during uh, Mario's uh, presentation. And as uh, he has uh, mentioned, uh, there is not a straightforward answer uh, to this question, but we have to, to go on, on case by case. And uh, the first uh, thing is, uh, it has been already mentioned, uh, we have to, to look into the, the treaty concern because uh, in many cases there are a uh, few uh, provisions in the particular treaty that uh, deals with, with these issues, basically to exclude those uh, individuals that benefit from, from these uh, tax incentives to the, to the scope of, of the treaty and other, in other cases, like uh, in particular in the case of uh, remittance basis regimes, they establish uh, uh, when uh, the treaty will, will apply, uh, that, that will be basically when the, the, the income is effectively remitted. So we could uh, find an answer directly in uh, sometimes in the, the specific provision of the, of the treaty concern. But uh, what about those cases in which we do not have uh, such a special provision? This is the, the very uh, difficult task that uh, I'm going to, to provide a few general ideas and maybe later on we can discuss more, more in deep. Uh, as Mario also has uh, mentioned, in those uh, cases we have to, to analyze the, uh, the residence article, Article 4, and uh, the main uh, features, the main characteristics of the uh, spatial tax regime we are addressing and in the light of uh, Article 4 of the, of the treaty concern. And uh, if we move uh, to Article 4, I guess that uh, uh, 
most uh, of you, if not all, are quite familiar with, uh, with this uh, provision, is divided in two main rules. Um, the first one it contains the, the general definition of uh, tax uh, residence in these terms. And the second one contains a restriction or an exclusion uh, clause of the concept of uh, residence for treaty purposes. Well, regarding the, the first one, is uh, based uh, basically in two uh, main uh, concepts or idea. So the first one is the liability to tax, which is something uh, different to, to being effectively subject to tax. And the second uh, one is the, the substantive or, or material uh, link with the state of residence. We, uh, we talked about uh, this issue uh, yesterday in the, in the afternoon. Well, regarding the special tax regimes uh, to, to benefit inward expatriates, uh, I think that uh, the first uh, requirement is uh, definitely fulfilled. So uh, for an individual to be beneficial of those special tax regimes, so it has to be uh, liable to tax, whether or not it's subject to tax. And regarding the, the material or substantive uh, criteria, I think that uh, no special issues uh, arise regarding the special tax uh, uh, regimes, as long as, uh, as Mario has uh, explained, they do not uh, deal with uh, special residence rules, but only the way in which the, the income is going to be taxed. So, uh, at least from my perspective, there's no uh, problem uh, when saying that uh, those individuals that uh, benefit uh, from uh, special tax uh, regimes fulfill the, the requirements, the two requirements of the first uh, part of Article 4.1. The second one is uh, quite uh, difficult to, to address, is the exclusion rule. The exclusion rule, is, uh, as you can and see in, in the slide, basically uh, exclude, uh, uh, excludes from the concept of tax residence those uh, individuals that are not tax uh, of foreign income. This is the basic uh, idea. So if we want to analyze the very origin of, uh, of this uh, uh, clause, uh, we should uh, go to the very early draft uh, of the OECD model in 1963 and the commentaries and uh, basically the idea was to uh, deal with uh, a very specific situation uh, with individuals that uh, were in most of the cases uh, related to diplomats and government services that moved to uh, another country uh, to provide service there and due to the uh, tax immunities uh, were taxed only on the income obtained in the new tax of residence. And due to the application of the double tax treaty, many situations of uh, non-taxation or double non-taxation arised. Well, that was the, the, the basic idea. And in the next version of the OECD model in 1977, uh, we we have this this provision that has been maintained in in subsequent versions uh, up to the to the present days well taking in consideration this background the the question is, are individuals benefiting from those uh, special tax regimes uh, mario has uh, presented excluded from the residence criteria well i've got uh, a pretty radical uh, position in in this respect uh, i'm very sorry but uh, from a pure uh, juridical perspective, in my view, uh, the regimes that uh, are out of the scope of, uh, of double tax treaties are those one that uh, taxed only income from the new resident estate. That's not the case, in my view. I know that it's uh, quite debatable, but that's not the case uh, uh, re regarding remittance-based uh, regimes. And those regimes do not uh, exempt from, from tax uh, uh, foreign income, but uh, a mere deferral of, of taxation. And uh, actually, 
as it has been uh, mentioned, and I uh, mentioned too at the beginning of my presentation, many uh, double tax treaties uh, include special provisions to explicitly exclude from the scope of this uh, of the particular treaty those uh, individuals benefiting from these uh, regimes, and also the, the commentaries in, in this uh, case provide uh, some uh, insight in, in this respect when saying that uh, those individuals uh, uh, that benefit from this uh, regime qualify as, uh, as uh, resident for, for treaty uh, purposes unless the contracting states uh, introduce a, a clause uh, departing from, from the model. The second group of uh, schemes uh, are those like the Portugal, one of the Italy and the, the Spain uh, cases that uh, provide uh, certain exemption for certain uh, income obtained uh, abroad. Even the, the majority of, of foreign income is exempt. There is a certain pie items of income that remain uh, taxable. Well, in, in my view, and uh, for the reasons that I mentioned previously regarding the, the second sentence of Article uh, 141, I think that uh, those regimes uh, do not fulfill uh, the, the requirements uh, to be excluded uh, from, the, from the scope of the, of the treaty. And the uh, the case of Spain is, uh, as uh, Mario very good uh, has uh, already explained, a uh, tricky uh, scheme uh, because uh, it uh, contained uh, a provision in the domestic legislation according to which uh, those individuals uh, that benefit from these uh, inward expatriate uh, tax regimes are considered uh, residents for domestic purposes, although they apply the non-resident rules to, to determine the, the, the taxable base. And, uh, however, they are not considered resident for double tax treaty. This is an explicit clause that uh, we have in, in our uh, domestic legislation in, in Spain. Well, in my view, this, uh, this regime is, uh, and in particular, this clause is quite uh, problematic. Uh, for, for many different reasons. The first one is uh, because, uh, at least in my view, whether an individual has to be considered uh, a tax resident is something that uh, has not been determined by domestic legislation, but on the wording of the double tax treaty concern. And second, there are also some double tax treaties, like, uh, for instance, the case of uh, Germany and, and Spain that contain a special clause excluding those uh, individuals that benefit from the Spanish regime. That uh, is quite uh, is strange if we have this uh, domestic provision. But this is the way in which uh, I think we have to, to deal with those issues. So go directly into the particular uh, DTC. And uh, secondly, because I have already mentioned, I think that uh, the, the Spanish regime doesn't fulfill the second sentence uh, uh, requirement of Article 4.1. Why? Because as uh, Mario has uh, already mentioned, somehow employment income is uh, taxed, not only at resident, but also foreign uh, employment income, which is uh, a broader concept than merely salary, because it includes also pension and, and other uh, kind of, of incomes in the concept of, uh, uh, of labor income. And last but not least, Spain has not included in all treaties the second sentence of uh, Article uh, 4.1. There are some, some treaties, like the, the case of uh, Canada, the, the Netherlands, and Singapore, and a few more, that uh, do not include this second sentence. So the, the question of residence is determined just only on the basis of the liability to tax, which is, in my view, uh, completely fulfilled in, in those cases. So. I think that uh, we've got some uh, treaty of the right uh, problem with, uh, with this provision. And uh, finally, uh, regarding this uh, 
Lamsam or flag taxis uh, that uh, Mario has already uh, explained uh, very good. Well, uh, I think that there are also strong arguments uh, to to support that uh, those uh, uh, individuals that benefit from from these uh, special tax regimes are also uh, resident for double tax treaty purposes. Well, as Mario has mentioned, those uh, taxes uh, are in lieu of the general individual income tax, so they tax uh, uh, income. And uh, in this respect, uh, we could uh, say that uh, it is uh, fulfilled the, the requirement of the second sentence. Uh, there are also uh, some countries, uh, in particular uh, in Switzerland, that uh, in the double tax treaty contain a special provisions in this respect, uh, determining uh, in, in which cases those particular uh, individuals that benefit from these uh, the schemes would be entitled or, or not to the to the treaty. And and finally, I think that the the United States uh, model could uh, provide some light uh, in order to interpret the Article 4.1 of the OECD United Nations, because uh, both are quite uh, pretty similar in this uh, particular uh, point. Uh, according to the United States uh, model, they uh, include the, the second sentence, but the, the scope is uh, much uh, broader, uh, because uh, uh, it is also excludes from the definition of residence any person whose tax is determined in the contracting state on a fixed fee, forfeit, or similar basis. That means, in my view, that sensu contrario, if we don't have a specific uh, provision in this respect, this is uh, basically because uh, those uh, uh, regimes are included in the scope of the of the treaty so the 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 exclusion rule of the united states is uh, broader as uh, i've already mentioned in in this respect and i think that uh, it makes sense to take it uh, into consideration in order to to interpret the the article uh, for one of the of the model well in conclusion uh as i have uh, pointed uh, out at the beginning of, of the presentation, we have to go in uh, on ba case by case uh, to analyze uh, those, uh, those situations. But uh, in most of the cases, those uh, individuals are going to be in a really good uh, tax position because they are going to benefit uh, from the particular uh, tax schemes. And also, they are going to be entitled to treaty benefits that uh, in many cases, the situation uh, would uh, uh, arise as uh, double non-taxation, or definitely non-taxation, in particular in those uh, types of uh, or items of incomes that are taxed only at the resident estates, like uh, pensions or business uh, income, or in some cases, uh, employment income, and an unqualified uh, income too. But uh, the way in which uh, I think uh, we have to deal with uh, with this issue, maybe states are happy with the situation and they don't really want to do anything in this respect. But if we want to tackle those, uh, I think, uh, unequal uh, situations, is uh, at least at the at the level of of international tax law is by modifying and renegotiating the the double tax treaties, including a special uh, provision in this respect, or taxation at, at source or limitation of uh, of benefits uh, clauses, but not uh, uh, expanding the the scope of Article Four because the the scope is uh, what it is and said what it says. And that's it uh, from my side. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much for your presentation, Professor Lopez. And now we have uh, our third uh, speaker, Professor Andres uh, Baez Moreno from the University Carlos Tres, Madrid. 
and uh, Professor Moreno uh, considers uh, whether one also very interesting question, uh, whether uh, a transfer of individuals, uh, transfer of residents of, uh, and individuals uh, uh, can, uh, can be simulated or can be artificial. Uh, so uh, uh, he, he uh, deals uh, with uh, the mobility of individuals uh, from the aspect of anti-abuse rules with a special focus on the uh, principal purpose test. So uh, we will probably in these presentations uh, give some, uh, um, obtain some answers what are the principal purposes of the transfer of residents of an individual, but of course, in the book, uh, which will come, uh, I hope in uh, next year, uh, all of us will have the possibility to read much more about all topics covered in this international conference. So the floor is yours, Andres. Thank you. Uh, I would think it would be kind of a circular, strange exercise to express my gratitude to the organizers to be here. However, I would like to express my gratitude to Sverislav. He has been pushing this whole thing in a way you cannot imagine. So thank you, Sverislav, for being that strange mix of kindness and efficiency that is so difficult to find in the market. Um, my, my wife is almost perfect, but she's an administrative lawyer and she's been messing around for me, with me for years on the fact that we tax lawyers are obsessed with abuse. And when I had her almost convinced that this was not the case because I've been one year devoted with these guys to transfers of residents, mobility of individuals. Then she asked me, so what is exactly the title of your panel in uh, Belgrade? And I say anti-abuse rules and mobility of individuals. And she started laughing. She didn't say anything. So the whole point of my paper and the whole point of my words now, is to try and demonstrate just this once that my wife is wrong. Um, the purpose of the paper is very modest. Actually, I am all the time thinking in a case that has been already mentioned here on these YouTubers changing residence from Spain to Andorra. But sometimes simplifying reality or using very stylized examples help us to understand the way in which rules are applied and particularly the ways in which rules shouldn't be applied. Well, of course, uh, oh, I was saying next slide, but I'm in control of this. Um, I don't know how to move it. There we go. Uh, of course, the immediate reaction to these transfers of residence by uh, individuals would be this targeted emigration taxes that normally change the different or normal regimes regarding realization of income or territorial basis for taxation or in the indefinite nature of certain tax benefits. And of course, that's what many countries have used. There has been intense research on that, not just on IFA. There was also an, a new IFA panel for Cancun 2020 that never happened, of course. Let's see if it, uh, if it uh, happens next year, that I hope it will. But the conclusion I made in the paper in relation to this targeted immigration taxes or exit taxes, trailing taxes, and recopter clauses is that they are very short answer to a more or to a deeper problem. They are limited in their scope by nature. 
they are normally based upon private law concepts, many often, so easy to circumvent. And they have a lot of legal threats, not just from the point of view of treaties, but also from the point of view now in a pure European scenario from EU law. You might think, well, the case law of the European Court of Justice has been relatively lenient with exit taxes, and this is true. However, in the very moment in which European Court of Justice changed the justification ground for these taxes and started saying, in my opinion correctly, this is not justified upon the risk of abuse, but upon a balanced allocation of taxing rights. The judgment of proportion in relation to that justification becomes very difficult. And there is an easy reason for this. Whereas, of course, there is not a natural concept of abuse. But we can more or less from common sense deduce what is not abusive. What is the common sense approach to what is balance allocation of taxing rights? Of course, we might be very nuanced and try to somehow reconduce balance allocation of taxing rights to more specific and to the ground justifications like coherence. This has been already made. But if we just talk about balance allocation of taxing rights, so what is proportional and not proportional in relation to that? So countries do well in being uncertain on how will their exit taxes be judged according to the proportionality judgment by the European Court of Justice. The addition of all these problems, and now I'm doing somehow kind of science fiction exercise, might provoke the tax authorities turning their eyes to different rules that do not have the problems that we have seen before. Um, the first attitude, a possible aptitude, and I have seen that already in my country, is just to try and consider that the transfer of residence by an individual is simulated. I think more or less we all know what we're talking about, call it sham transaction doctrine, simulation, simulation, scheingeschäft. In the end, it's a blatant discrepancy between what you have said in your paper let's call it tax return, and the natural reality. If you are changing your residence to a country with pure formal criteria, and there are countries having pure formal criteria to define residence of individuals, I think that it is impossible to have it as simulated. I mean, if you just have to go and register yourself, well, you must be very, very clumsy to do a simulated change of residence. If, on the other hand, and that's more common, you're changing your resident to a typical country with residence criteria linked to physical presence, of course, simulation is possible in pure hypothetical terms. If country X, which is your destination country, says 183 days, and you are not 183 days there, that's a simulation. However, this might prove very difficult for the, let's call it home state, original state resident, in as much as normally you would have a certificate of residence. So unless you say, and this is happening in Spain, well, in Switzerland, certificates of residence are given without any special requisites. I have even heard well, not said explicitly that they are less given. You know, I don't want to say what I, uh, what, what I what I've heard. We've got a lot of Swiss colleagues here that might, uh, I hope, confirm that that's not the case. So actually, of course, we can go into nuances later on 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 simulation and transfer of residence. I think simulation is a no way normally for tackling changes of residence by individuals. So maybe tax authorities may be turning their eyes to traditional guards, to the traditional guards that we have in the Spanish tax code, that Germany has in Abgabenordnung, and that many countries 
Um, I think the first reflection here, and this has been indicated explicitly in a very recent paper from Professor Schoen, is that there is no natural concept of abuse. So in order to level a transaction abusive, one must say according to which rule, according to which GAR. So what I am doing here is trying to confront traditional GARs that we find in the GARs market based upon objective or more or less objective concepts like artificiality, inadequacy, unnaturality, or non-genuine transactions, and then move to what we have ahead, that is the principal purpose test, that in my opinion is a very different guard. If we have a transfer of resident again, and now I invert the order, to a country that requires physical presence, I think it's extremely difficult to apply one of those traditional guards to a transfer of residence. What is artificiality that's difficult to describe? I think the best definition is internally contradictive transactions. And again, that's a definition from Professor Schoen. And it is extremely difficult to support legally and logically that moving your resident and complying with the criteria of the destination country is internally contradictive. Besides, if we are talking about GARs, and that is very common, that take into consideration business purpose or economic effects, I think it's even more difficult. Think about what changing resident means in personal terms, in legal terms, apart from just the pure tax considerations. However, I think there's still here a small problem. What if you are moving to a country with pure formal residence criteria? Yesterday, I heard here fictitious changes of residence. It's not the case that we'll go back to simulation. We're not in that scenario. But what about in these cases, if you move to a country that grants you residence just complying with formal criteria, but you still live in your original country? Might this be level artificial? I think that problem legally is more complicated. And it's more complicated because you have to consider artificial according to which country? the original country or the destination country. What I did here is whenever you find a question, a difficult question you cannot answer, try to find a different way. That's what I did for this very specific case. If you want, we go in the colloquium on this particular topic. I have an answer for this. It's not based upon the GAR. It's based upon other considerations, but I don't want to waste my time because now I want to move what I think we have again in the future, which is the PPT. What is written here dates back to 1977. That's in the commentary to Article 1 of the OECD model since 1977, suggesting another case you have to add here, I forgot, of treaty abuse would be, and just read what is written there. And if you read that, you might think that any change of residence, of course this is referred to a very peculiar situation in relation to capital gains, but what about our YouTubers changing residence? Does this apply, yes or no? Well, this is just an example. I strongly recommend that you read the tough critic down by Professor Browner on this and other examples that I totally share. My main concern here is how this will be connected, remember, since 1977, to the principal purpose test rule when written or when read in combination. And now let's try and do an analytic study of the PPT in relation to our very simple case of transferring residence to Andorra by YouTubers. 
Is there a benefit of the treaty obtained by the YouTubers? It has been sometimes suggested, no, there is not. Because actually, the real benefit of the treaty is not Article 4, but whatever distributive rules in the treaty these YouTubers are trying to access. I don't share that point. At least in relation to the Spanish YouTubers, the rule they wanted to access was Article 4, 2 of the treaty between Spain and Andorra. Because what they wanted is to break any possible residence link to Spain. And they got that through 4, 2. They're not interested in Article 17 or Article 15. Many of the items of income, and this was suggested yesterday in relation to these YouTubers, is not or are not contained in the treaty. They can just get these benefits from the Spanish sourcing rules whatsoever, so they don't need the distributive rules. So I think that here the benefit that they are trying to access is the tiebreak rules. Why? Because the tiebreak rules are very easy to plan. Because the first tiebreak rule says permanent home available. And that's totally under the control of the taxpayer and is the first and the decisive rule. Let's now go to the two tests according to which a transaction might be considered abusive according to the principal purpose test. I will go very fast on relation to the so-called subjective prong of the PPT, one of the principal purposes. I know there have been intensive efforts, especially by scholars, to try and put some rationality on the law, which I think it's very difficult. Of course, if Professor Weber would be the judge in charge when applying the PPT, I would trust the final result. But as we say in Spanish, I know my musicians. And my musicians apply the PPT as strictly the PPT is written, one of the principal purposes. So there is no hesitation whatsoever that in many cases of transfer of residence, particularly in this dramatic situation, Spanish YouTubers, think about it. Personal Income Tax Act in Spain and in Andorra are identical. In fact, it's just a copy in Catalan of the Spanish law with one difference, the tax rate, of course, which is 10% in Andorra. So I think that assuming that maybe we might be out of the PPT in these cases through the subjective element is done to failure according to the judges that we have. So in the end, as you have written in the presentation, everything boils down to the object and purpose of the provision that has been allegedly abused. What is that provision? It's Article 4 in these cases. Article 4 1 as a door to access Article 4 2. Because what I want again is to break any residence link to the original state. And which is the object and purpose of that provision? And if we go to the commentaries, it's pretty clear that it's just facilitating the definition of the scope in the treaty, resolving issues of double taxation due to source residence conflicts and resolving residence residence country, uh, conflicts, so double residence issues. And does the resident of a YouTuber in Andorra, which by the way has a treaty with Spain, comply with this purpose? Of course. In order to say no, we have to add to the purpose of Article 4.1 Something that is first not written there and not even written in the commentaries. It's not said anywhere that one of the purposes of Article 4 is guaranteeing a substantive connection between the alleged residence and the territory in which the taxpayer alleges to be a resident. There are more arguments for this than just this is not said in the commentaries later in the debate. We can go on this if you want to. Finally, this might sound horrible for certain years, 
this might sound frustrating when saying, well, and we built all this just to conclude that the principal purposes cannot be applied to this case. And here I think we have the risk of having a different reading of the principal purpose test that combined to that example and combined additionally by the change of title of the model that, remember, must be included in all covered tax agreement because it's a minimum standard. So will be massively incorporated to double tax conventions. Might us think, well, the point here is not the object or purpose of the provision. It is the general purpose of the treaty, which is not facilitating abuse by means of treaty shopping, blah, 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 blah. And there we run the risk of finishing in a circular exercise in which in order to apply the PPT because something is abusive, we have to check whether a transaction is abusive according to the preamble. And then we might end up in our example saying, of course, there is an example in the commentary to Article 1 labeling this as abusive. I think we should strongly reject this way to approach to the principal purpose test because I think it's legally wrong. So I think I've proven that my wife was wrong. I think that as far as we don't have a BEPS 3.0 with a general approach to rules just changing this dramatically, perhaps if we think these changes of residence are problematic, we should focus in more modest policy objectives, like, for example, changing Article 4.2, which, as you have seen in many cases, is the very origin of the problem. Because I never understood why 4.3 was changed in the last changes to the model, whereas 4.2 wasn't, perhaps because BEPS was on companies and corporations, but not on individuals. But think about it. The PPT is applicable to all taxpayers companies, and individuals. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Moreno, for your inspiring presentations. And now I give the chair to Professor Weber, who will lead uh, the discussions. Uh, and as I can see, we have about 20 minutes for that. OK. Thank you very much. Uh, I'll look a little bit to the organization if we maybe can, can have maybe a little bit more time because we started later, but I will try to, uh, to, to be on time, not to destroy the rest of the program for the day because we do not want that everything is running out of time. Um, so we have Cecile Martin and Paolo Ludovici who will, uh, will, will start the discussion uh, and, uh, at this moment. And after that, we will see if we have also enough time for uh, for the for the for the audience to uh, to enter into the discussion, uh, we have to watch out that we do not uh, that, that we do not end up only in abuse uh, discussions. Uh, um, now we will see. Maybe we end up. Uh, you know, I like the, uh, the the abuse discussion. By the way, uh, Celine, uh, you uh, you will prepare the statement. So the panelists first prepare the statement or question. Uh, in which they reply to the to the speakers, and after that we will see where what's what's going to happen. So the floor is yours. Thank you. So we've heard a lot of abuse, um, <laughs> and there's um, you discuss three instruments to tackle the problem that we have in our current system. That's targeted exit taxes. It's the general anti-avoidance rules, and it's the principal purpose test and your paper and your contribution is very, very critical, and I think rightly so. Um, when I read your chapter, I got very depressed. <laughs> not because it was not brilliant, it was very, very brilliant, but because I had to ask myself the question, can we not do better than that? Do we have to talk abuse? Because what we want as humans is pursuing happiness and um, translated into tax law. I suppose that's uh, value creation and economic rent creation. Um, 
for state financing. That's free movement, that's best allocation of talent. Equal opportunities is another word we have heard yesterday. Yet what we're talking is abuse. Um, and at the same time, there are there are movements or there are these uh, these words about a fiscal contract, about tax morale. And I was asking myself the question, shouldn't we tackle the problem the other way around? Um, maybe as an example for tax morale, there have been observations by the OECD that, for instance, when state services go up, the trust in the state goes up and tax morale goes up. Um, so this is, this is proven statistics. Um, the other thing is, I wonder if this is a generation issue, if maybe in a couple of years' time people look at it differently. I'd like to um, briefly touch on an example from my country where uh, um, apparently resident certificates are issued freely to everyone everywhere. So just come in and queue and we give you one. <laughs> <laughs> of course, that is not, is not so, no, but these tax regimes, apparently, they are as systematic. And there is, um, in, in Switzerland, we have a strong democratic system, and there has been a, a public vote, not yet, about eight years ago, about the abolishment of the lump sum regime. And, and arguments were that tax privileges were violating constitutional principles, and they requested tax fairness for all. Now... I must say it was rejected by 60%. So you can, I, I leave it up to you to judge uh, about the tax morale of the Swiss people back then. But <laughs> fact, fact is, discussion is changing and there are several cantons that have abolished this system. So I think we are on the right way. And uh, going forward, we should really rethink Nexus. Um, if we have a tax that is, uh, is directly linked to a residence, then maybe we are not to go ex nunc, but maybe have a calculation that goes a couple of years in the past instead of going the abuse road. Um, and, and also get tax sustainability and legal certainty for taxpayers. Um, I hope we have some time to discuss the, the, the conflict between residency as a physical fact that can be proven and the abuse rules that more go on the object. Um, I would like to, to, to um, just briefly touch on one concept that in my practice see is not working and this is article for to the second sentence where you have like, if you have essentially, um, if you're not taxed, then you don't have treaty benefits. It doesn't really work so much because that's not in all the treaties. And often times people who have lump sum regimes, they have sophisticated systems in place that prevent a lot of taxes to happen in the first place. And then eventually, if you have a withholding tax, let's say of 15% on a dividend, but then it's, You'd, you'd have to change the system in Switzerland to include this income in your Swiss um, taxable basis and you pay in Switzerland 30%, you will just not care. So you have a couple of jurisdictions that might have the taxation basis with withholding tax, but that doesn't really solve the problem of the system as such. Um, and then maybe one just one positive thing that has not been in the papers, but it has been touched on yesterday, um, that was the article by, by Bhagwadi about taxing the brain drain. We must not forget that even though we are tax lawyers, we also have the context of other legal rules such as immigration. So if we give visas, in my example of Switzerland, only to people who are highly qualified, unless they're from the EU, we actually, we have a starting point to say this is a brain drain from, let's say, India. We are importing a specialist from India, so why not take this as a starting point to maybe redistribute some of the taxes back for the first years? Okay, thank you very much. Uh, I do not know if the panel wants to uh, react on this. Just, uh, I'm, I'm not saying that I don't believe in tax morale, which I do, of course, intensively, but I think the way to express tax morale should be a democratic way in which exactly countries, and particularly their 
inhabitants decide where to put the fair share. Instead of having some rules and trying to massage these rules and make them say something that is according to the particular perception of the tax morale by the particular applicant of the rule in a particular case, by the way, in a totally non-democratic approach, because, again, that has not been decided by the majority. On the other hand, in relation to the second question, I think it is very clear that BEPS didn't rethink residence. This was left part on purpose. So we might dislike that. We might think that residence should have been one of the main points of BEPS, but it wasn't. So even I think BEPS has reinforced some of the problems or the traditional problems of residence. And I think that the possibility of having residence linked to pure formal criteria has been, in fact, reinforced by the BEPS work. So, again, this is a question on... Now, before he was saying me, I was finished, but, but uh, yeah, I have to finish. So, uh, uh, yeah, I finished. That's it. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, sorry, sorry. I think that is why. Yeah. yeah. You're recording yourself. <laughs> I think your wife, your wife wants to follow the, uh, the abuse part. You go. Yes. Uh, well, thank you very much, uh, Feline, for, for the remarks. I, I, I totally agree with you that uh, the, the current uh, wording of Article 4.2 uh, probably uh, doesn't, doesn't work, but uh, I'm not so sure if uh, whether uh, Article 4.2 is the, the solution in, in for, for those uh, problems. So probably we, we expect too much uh, on, the, on the residence definition and probably the, the solution would be uh, in in a completely different uh, direction, uh, as I mentioned at the end of, of the presentation, so taxation at source or uh, uh, limitation of benefits and, or other uh, more specific clause to, to tackle those those situations will be probably more effective than uh, a general uh, chain in an article article two article four two. Yeah. Okay. Um. Do you want to say something, Mario? Just, just to follow up uh, to what Hugo said, when we look at the uh, OECD commentary, I think no special tax regime really falls into the scope of what the uh, commentary says when it refers to um, a taxpayer who is considered to be a resident according to the domestic laws but is subject only to a taxation limited to the income from sources in that state. The only case which I found is the Israeli tax regime, where all foreign source income is exempt. But apart from that, no other regime really provides, a, let's say, a, a full exemption of foreign source income. And as I said, there is a ruling by the Israeli tax authorities, which I think is very interesting, whereby you are treated entitled if you live on the Israeli territory, and if you have a permanent home, so if you spend there at least 142 days, and if you have a permanent home in, in Israel. So coming back what what you said, yes, permanent home it can be manipulated. But if you're forced to live there 142 days, I think that the, the, the connection with the territory starts becoming, you know, gen genuine, genuine, genuine. This is, this is inbound, <laughs> not outbound. But that makes the residency question really burn down to a question of proof and factual circumstances. And any abuse rules don't really have anything to do with these factual circumstances. So they should actually be totally removed from Article 4. Okay, thank you very much. Um, Paolo Ludovici, who's, who's maybe uh, one of the persons in this room 
with the most experience in uh, in, in the private individuals. Uh, he will also make his uh, statement, reply or question. I'm very good in talking about other business. I talk about football and not a football okay. player. I talk about mobile high net worth individual and not mobile. I'm not high net worth individual. So, but uh, apart from that, uh, it's very stimulating comment, uh, and uh, there are a lot of ideas uh, brought uh, on this table. Um, coming back to what uh, Mario said, uh, and uh, uh, I will comment later on. Mario said there are no specific regime targeted to exactly the situation focused by the OECD. But why? Because there is an abuse. Because the states draft the law in a way to circumvent what uh, the same states have put in the OECD. So then uh, this is a sort of evolu evolution. And uh, in my view, uh, we should start talking in many circumstances about abuse by states. Second. When we talk about uh, residents, uh, uh, obviously we are talking about uh, genuine residents and not genuine residents. But the uh, oral rules of states uh, are designed in a way to determine whether a person is resident in your state or resident outside that state. Uh, the rules are not designed to determine in which foreign state uh, the person is resident. And so, therefore, for instance, uh, uh, Italy applies the treaty to somebody who is Switzerland. How can we determine that it's a really Swiss resident? Then we rely on treaty certificates, but treaty certificates are made by a state which has all the interest to say it's resident and treaty protected. So how can we determine whether it's really, there is really a connection under Article 4.1 based on a substantive element? And then uh, you exchange information, but if you exchange information, likely the answer will be it's resident. You ask additional information to the taxpayer to understand whether there is a real connection in that country. But again, you may understand this is a general context, not with special regimes, but with special regimes is even more important. Then with Italian people, Italian colleagues, we know that when people come to Italy, the first question is, which is the minimum number of days that has to stay in Italy in order to be considered resident? Because ideally, they may like to be considered resident of Italy without being in Italy. And basically, basically, based on Italian rules, they can, they can. So if uh, I'm registered in Italy as a resident and I live abroad, I never put any foot in Italy, I'm still resident of Italy with the certificate of residence. Second point, uh, Italy, we have the flat tax. The flat tax regime is exactly the situation of uh, Treaty override, the new form of treaty override. We know what uh, uh, the treaty says, and I designed the law expressly to accommodate the needs of the treaty. And therefore, we have the flat tax, and the flat tax uh, is uh, in substitution of income tax on foreign uh, income. And uh, the not saying is in substitution of a number of taxes, but just on income taxes. And say, if you have the flat tax, you are exempt from other taxes. So there is no confusion about that. And uh, they say flat tax is uh, like a foreign tax, substitute tax uh, included in the, the definition and so forth. That's very clear. And uh, uh, the other point, uh, obviously, when we go to talk with uh, French lawyers, Dutch lawyers, other lawyers, they say, we don't know whether French authorities would accept that. We don't know whether Dutch authorities would accept that. And then we say, OK, since there is a risk that this might not be accepted, then we include the so-called opt-out. And the opt-out means that uh, uh, if you come uh, to, rise, uh, to Italy, you can decide, for instance, uh, to say, I pay 100,000 on any foreign source income, but for income from that state. And if you look at the treaty, it's sufficient that you are taxed on Italian income, but also on foreign income. So I decide, I opt out for income from some Australian, Australian income from Australia. I am nothing from Australia, but this is enough. Or I put uh, 10 million to Australia. So I have some income from Australia. I pay taxes on that to invest in Australian shares. That, is this enough to say that uh, I am a resident uh, in, uh, in Italy because I pay tax in other countries. That's very important because uh, all the examples uh, are made also by OCD are uh, resident of state A that moves to state B 
and the capital gain is income from state A. But there may be a lot of uh, uh, other situations, as you rightly mentioned, like the case uh, uh, of Andorra. So uh, the uh, opt-out is important. I think with Switzerland, we have to opt out for the specific state. I want to have protection from uh, the treaty between Switzerland and Italy. I have to opt in for Italy. Whilst uh, here, we can opt out for any country and not that one. But uh, you know, this is a concept, in my view, of uh, uh, abuse. But uh, what is also strange is that uh, on one side, uh, the law has been designed this way, and then we said, OK, then uh, remittance basis, uh, especially if people pay remittance based charge, is basically the same when it out to so. And then we got uh, rulings that say totally not. For arguments, uh, they say the remittance basis uh, and the remittance basis taxation of foreign income is a mere possibility. And this is the concept of optional taxation. That's very important. Second, the application of the treaty may result in phenomena of double non taxation which are contrary to treaties, as BEPS is demonstrating, but BEPS does not apply to individuals. Uh, we say, provided that I say, I want to say no, what justification can I draw to say no? And then the other point, uh, the remittance-based charge is uh, a tax, it's, a, it's not a tax, but it's a fee to enter into the regime. For UK guys, they know that it's totally wrong. And they also said uh, the commentary you know, there was a commentary in, uh, uh, 2000, in, in uh, 2003 which says uh, people want to protect this, they can include uh, in new treaties. They say this is a commentary in 2003 while the treaty was in 1988. And uh, it's the same country says we modified 2003, but it was also for other periods. So, and uh, that's, that's very strange. So this comes back also to the issue that you had, which is uh, uh, consistency. And uh, how can you say that uh, Italians are entitled to the flat tax regime and guys in UK are not entitled? The answer was even, the, it's totally different because in Italy, if you want to have the regime, you have to come from the long period, whilst in the UK, you can be for a short term. Indeed, you are not domiciled, but uh, it's totally confusion of terms. So this, uh, this is a, a concept which is important, but uh, why uh, they draw this conclusion? Because they want to interpret the law in a sense. I don't like that uh, you don't pay taxes and you have to pay uh, elsewhere. The concept of stateless income tax morale, probably under the same argument, uh, they would deny treaty benefit to a Greek guy making investment in Italy, even if the system is exactly as the Italian one. So that's a way that uh, they say is contrary to the spirit of the treaty, but the spirit of the treaty interpreted by now, not uh, when the treaty was tough. So the, we have the concept of the tax morale, which is a moving target. And uh, as you mentioned, so the spirit is there, but uh, now with the tax morale, the spirit is totally different. And how can I understand, based on the law, where is the tax morale? Last but not least, uh, you mentioned uh, the case of qualification. There are a lot of situations. For instance, uh, we have uh, people uh, working in Switzerland. They are employee in uh, Switzerland, the Swiss law, and the Italian uh, authorities say, no, you are not an employee. So the qualification of employment income is based on uh, Swiss law, where you are employed, or based on Italian law based on its own criteria. But uh, this is a situation that you can see in other countries. Uh, qualification, uh, the, we have uh, the situation, uh, for instance, uh, Apple stock, you may invest in Apple stock through an Italian bank. Uh, dividends from Apple are Italian, are US source income, but capital gains on Apple are Italian source income because uh, the, the shares are in Italy. So if I go to France, I say I pay taxes on foreign source income because uh, the definition of foreign source income may be based on the treaty, not based uh, on Italian law. And also the concept that Mario was saying uh, is the concept of uh, employment, because uh, if I earn 100, uh, and uh, normally I split between countries based on uh, working days, uh, but uh, now uh, the position of Italian tax authorities, I don't know whether the same for other countries, but uh, based on my understanding, not. The allocation should be made based on calendar days because now with mobiles, you work from everywhere. 
if uh, in the weekend uh, you send an email, that's working day, and then the allocation should be made on uh, 365 days. And then you can understand that uh, if uh, you are in Spain and Spain adopts a different principle, you may end up with a double taxation. Thank you very much. Um, we're running out of time. We are, I, I take a little bit more uh, more time. Uh, Mario? Yeah. yeah. Very quick reaction to what Paolo said. You're right. Of course, the Italian rules that not do, do not entail a minimum stay requirement in Italy. But so what? It's a problem of the taxpayer because he will have German tax authorities chasing him for the full period in which he claims to be Italian tax resident. So I don't think it's a, it's an issue that we should uh, concern about from the state of residence perspective. Because he's... he's, he's, he's Italian tax resident, full stop. I think one one interesting point uh, is also what you mentioned about the the, the, the example of the uh, sale of the uh, qualified shareholding. I think the Italian uh, tax regime is interesting because it also uh, provides for a countering measure to this situation. So if you move to Italy just to dispose, to alienate your qualified shareholding, uh, the tax regime the special flat tax will not apply. And so he or she will pay ordinary uh, uh, Italian tax unless, unless, via a ruling with the Italian tax authorities, the taxpayer commits to stay in Italy for five more years under the flat tax regime. So it's a countermeasure within the regime to avoid, uh, uh, let's say, um, situation of, of abuse like the ones that you that you mentioned okay i i look to the rest of the panel for you know. every reaction small one very small very small short reaction. one i mean um that is another topic that is raised also in my paper this case of circular uh resident situations in which you go back however I think we shouldn't assume so lightly that the fact of going back is abused because if you went in the first place and the effects of a real or I said a material transfer of residence were complied with in that year or in two years, so you move with the family, which you can do for one year perfectly, and it has economic effects different from the mere tax saving, why should be that abusive according to traditional concepts of abuse? So I'm not so convinced that per se every circular movement, because we're always thinking with corporations in our mind, and we just say, okay, you go and then you go back, because it's just, I mean, we know how this works, but, but individuals are very different creatures, and their movements are accompanied by a whole array of economic, personal, and, and non-tax considerations that perhaps in the case of, of corporations are not present. So... But uh, that I don't have 100% clear. Okay, thank you very much. I look to the audience. If there is a really pressing thing, if you otherwise the world collapse, let's say, if you cannot make that statement. Yeah, you. No, no, okay. We have five minutes. We have five minutes. We can. Sorry. Um, there is a <laughs> microphone or not? Otherwise, you stand up and scream a bit. Hi. Speaking loud. So I want to thank the panel uh, for providing clarity on this point. Uh, I'd like to mention that the subcommittee on the update of the UN model has just pre prepared a paper on a subject to tax rule, and I anticipated that some people might question why we needed a subject to tax rule when we have the principal purpose test. And this panel has just explained that perfectly. So thank you very much. Okay, so we have, we have time for another uh, remark, question. Sorry, but you didn't tell whether flat tax is enough to say it's subject to tax under the new model. Well, we, we can discuss that later on during the break. Please. Very, very short remark. I would like to come back to Mario three points. He said, lively tax, cover tax, 
and that the lump sum is paid for the foreign sourced income. And if you look to the Swiss forfait, if you go to the tax code, you will find a separate paragraph in the tax code which said taxation on expenses. And the tax base is actually foreign and Swiss expenses. And the taxpayer has to declare his expenses, what his, his consumption, yachts, cars, houses. And this is basically a consumption tax. It's not an income tax. And it's even written such in the law. And uh, of course, you can calculate consumption. You have income, less savings, and then you have the tax base of a personal consumption tax, which was proposed I think in the 50s in the US by Musgrave Musgrave, this would be an alternative tax to income. And it's a, it's a consumption tax. And then if you go on, you read, but at least 400,000 Swiss francs. And, the, and, the, and this lump sum is not for income, it's a minimum tax base for consumption. It's not an income tax, the 400,000. And then you read on, and then you read, yes, but at least, at least the same amount as income from Swiss sources, but still it's the, it's the expenses, it's a deemed expense. So substitute tax or not Swiss, is Swiss source income is just a reference to calculate the minimum expense. And then if we come back to your points, I think it's not, it's not liable tax because tax means an income tax. So it's actually really not covered by the tax treaty. Okay, thank you very much, very clear. Um, we have to close this, uh, this panel. I think uh, we learned a lot, at least I learned a lot. I'd like to, to thank the panelists, the speakers, my, my co-hosts, um, the organization, of course, and the audience. And uh, we have a coffee break now. Thank you very much. <laughs>